Once upon a time, there was a girl who would grow up to achieve great fame on the silver screen. But this movie star would also lead a little-known double life as a gifted inventor. Her name was Hetty. As a child, Hetty lived in Vienna, Austria. Her mother, Gertrude, was a concert pianist. Like her mother, Hetty loved the arts. She played piano and attended the opera. She also loved to take long walks with her father, Emil, a bank director. He understood and shared Hetty's curiosity about the world around her. As they walked throughout Vienna, Emil would explain to Hetty how the things they saw worked, like the electric streetcars passing by or the airplanes flying up in the sky. Hetty wanted to understand everything, and Emil was happy to help her learn. But Hetty didn't simply dream of understanding the world around her. She got to work doing. One day, she took apart her music box to study it. Hetty carefully examined all its complicated parts. Then she put it back together, all by herself. She was only five years old. I'm Tatiana Maslany, and this is Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls, a fairy tale podcast about the rebel women who inspire us. This week, Hetty Lamar. Hetty was born Hedwig Eva Maria Kiesler. An only child, she loved sneaking off to the movie theater. When she returned home, she would recreate the stories with her dolls on a makeshift stage underneath her father's desk. All my life, I had loved to play act and pretend, she once said. Hetty didn't attend school. Instead, she was privately tutored. By age 10, she could play piano, dance, and even speak four languages. When she was 12, she won a beauty contest in Vienna. Hetty didn't quite know how to feel about that. The brains of people are more interesting than the looks, I think, she'd later say. At the same time, Hetty dreamed of being on stage. At 16, she enrolled in acting classes at a famous director's school in Vienna. Later, she got work at a movie studio as a script girl, a person who ensured that what's filmed matched what's in the script. Just as Hetty had wanted to understand inventions like her music box, now she wanted to understand acting performances. She worked hard to master her craft, always studying other people's words and mannerisms. Soon, Hetty was offered an opportunity to be an extra in a film. It wasn't a big break, but it was Hetty's first step towards stardom. Hetty's European acting career grew swiftly. At just 17, she snagged a small speaking part in a German comedic film, Storm in a Water Glass. The next year, Hetty had her first lead role in the film No Money Needed. Her next role led to fame and scandal. She played a young wife in the controversial film Ecstasy, which was banned in both Germany and the United States. Hetty worried it might be difficult to get other roles, but soon she was cast as the Empress Elizabeth of Austria in a play. She got rave reviews. One of her admirers was a wealthy businessman named Fritz Mandel. He manufactured and sold weapons to armies. Hetty fell in love with Fritz, and at just 18, she married him. Her parents weren't pleased. As Jewish people, they didn't like that Fritz had ties to Italian dictator Benito Mussolini and to the rising Nazi party, which spread hatred. During her marriage to Fritz, Hetty didn't do much acting. She hosted fabulous parties at their fancy home. Sometimes, military leaders attended those parties and talked about their weapons and plans. By 1937, Hetty knew she no longer wanted to stay in Austria, nor in her marriage to Fritz. Around him, she was like a doll, having no mind, no life of her own. 
but she was afraid that Fritz would not let her go. As legend has it, Hetty hatched a daring, dramatic plan to escape. First, she hired a maid who looked like her to help out during a party. That night, while the maid slept in Hetty's bed, Hetty put on a maid's uniform which hid valuable jewels that she'd sewn inside. Then, on a bicycle, her path lit only by moonlight, Hetty pedaled away from her mansion and toward freedom. Hetty arrived in London, ready to restart her acting career. The important Hollywood studio chief, Louis B. Mayer, was so impressed by Hetty's talent that he offered her a contract with MGM, his movie studio. Hetty turned him down. Hetty knew working with MGM was her best chance of making it in Hollywood, but she wanted a better contract. She thought up a plan to convince Louis. First, Hetty booked a ticket on the same ship he was taking back to America. On board, she wore her finest clothing and worked her charm each time she ran into Louis and his wife, Margaret. They knew she had what it took to be a star and that MGM needed to sign her. Louis offered Hetty a better deal, and this time, she accepted. The only problem was her name. Hedvig Kiesler didn't sound glamorous enough for Hollywood. It was Margaret, staring out at the ocean, who helped come up with the perfect last name, Lamar. By the time the ship docked in New York City, reporters and photographers were waiting on the shore, ready to snap the first photos of MGM's newest starlet, Hedy Lamar. Although Hetty spoke four languages, at the time she sailed to America, she didn't know much English. It only took six months of lessons before she was ready to star in her first Hollywood movie, Algiers. Nobody knew how American audiences would react to this new film actress. One viewer said that when Hetty's face first appeared on the big screen, the whole audience gasped. Suddenly, Hetty was on the cover of all the movie magazines. People called her the most beautiful woman in the world. Her iconic face inspired Disney's Snow White and the original Catwoman. The movie studio kept Hetty busy. She worked long hours, filming six days a week. She starred in multiple movies each year, acting with big stars from that time, like Clark Gable, Spencer Tracy, James Stewart, and Judy Garland. Hetty herself quickly became one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. As busy as she was with her acting career, Hetty still had time for fun. She loved scavenger hunts and playing charades. Her hobby was tinkering and inventing. All creative people want to do the unexpected, she once said. She even turned a room of her house into an inventor's workshop. Some of its tools were from the famous aviator Howard Hughes, a friend who shared her passion. There, after she returned home from a long day on set, Hetty's brilliant mind became the star. She didn't have to work for ideas. They came to her naturally, much as they had during her curiosity-filled childhood. Inspired by fish and birds, she designed better wings for Howard's airplanes. Thinking of how it could be difficult to get soldiers and travelers soda to drink, Hetty invented a flavor cube that would turn plain water into fizzy cola. Wanting a place to put used tissues, she invented a paper fold that worked like a pocket on tissue boxes. Worrying about lost pets, she came up with a glow-in-the-dark collar. Her ideas were boundless. It was at a friend's dinner party that Hetty got the spark for her most important invention. In 1940, World War II was raging in Europe, and the Atlantic Ocean was one of the most dangerous places to be. German U-boats kept attacking ships, including ones filled with refugees. Hetty worried about her own mother, who was preparing to sail to safety in the United States. 
a torpedo could sink her mother's ship. At a dinner party, Hetty struck up a conversation with the composer, George Unthiel. The topic turned to the war and military weapons, which Hetty remembered much about from her marriage to Fritz. George himself had been a weapons inspector. Hetty wondered if the U.S. military might have a problem with their system for guiding torpedoes. Enemies could intercept radio signals to make the torpedoes go off course. George agreed that was a problem. And like Hetty, he enjoyed tinkering. The pair began working on a technology to make radio frequencies change according to a code. Doing so could make it difficult for enemies to intercept messages, securing radio communications. According to Hetty, she came up with the idea and George knew how to implement it. They even drew upon his experience with pianos to help design their technology. The pair called their invention a frequency hopping system. After months of work, they filled out an application for a patent. A patent is a license from the government that gives an inventor the right to their creation, so no one else can copy it. On August 11th, 1942, Hetty and George received a U.S. patent. Right away, they shared it with the U.S. Navy to put it to use. By then, America was at war, and Hetty wanted to do whatever she could to help the country win. To Hetty's dismay, the U.S. Navy didn't have the resources to use their invention right away. Recognizing its value, though, they classified it, making it secret and preventing Hetty and George from further developing it themselves. Hetty still wanted to do whatever it took to defeat the enemy. She considered quitting Hollywood to join the National Inventors Council to create other inventions to support the wartime effort. But officials told her she could help the most with her star power. Hetty got to work, traveling the country to sell war bonds a special type of loan that helped the U.S. government fund its military efforts during World War II. Through her appearances and promotions, Hetty sold $25 million in war bonds, which is over $340 million in today's money. She also volunteered to entertain the troops. She danced with soldiers to lift their spirits. She even washed dishes. Finally, in 1945, the war ended with victory for the United States and the Allies. In 1953, Hetty realized another dream. She finally became a U.S. citizen. The country she'd worked tirelessly to protect during the war, she could now call her home. Hetty continued starring in films, including the famous biblical epic, Samson and Delilah, and the hit comedy, My Favorite Spy. Sometimes, Hetty was frustrated by the poor quality of the scripts she was offered, so she began producing her own films, too. The Strange Woman in 1946, Dishonored Lady in 1947, and The Loves of Three Queens in 1954. It was unusual for an actress to break away from the powerful studios and create her own art. But that didn't stop Hetty. Hetty famously married six times, and she had three children. She retired from acting in 1958, and two years later, she received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Hetty once called her famously beautiful face her misfortune. She saw it as a mask she could not remove, one that made it hard for people to see the person she was and the ideas she had. For decades, nobody knew about Hetty's work as an inventor, but that didn't mean they didn't know about her invention. Before the patent expired in 1959, their technology was used by a military contractor to develop sauna buoys. These are devices that help detect submarines in the water. Hetty's invention kept evolving from that point on. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, U.S. torpedoes incorporated frequency hopping technology based on her work. By the early 1980s, 
the frequency hopping technology was finally declassified by the military. This meant that other inventors and companies could use it, and they eagerly did. Today, it's part of what keeps electronic communications like text messages private. It's also used in GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and expensive military satellites. How much do experts estimate the technology is worth today? Over $30 billion. Yet Hetty and George never received any payment for their invention. People finally did begin to recognize George and Hetty for their work before Hetty passed away in 2000. They received the Pioneer Award from the Electronic Frontier Foundation in 1997. Asked how she felt about the award, Hetty said, it's about time. Hello, I'm Maisie from New York City. I'm Sadie from Nashville, Tennessee. Today's episode was hosted by Tatiana Maslany. Tatiana is an Emmy award-winning actress best known for her role on BBC America's Orphan Black and films such as Stronger and Destroyer. The podcast is a production of Rebel Girls and Boom Integrated, a division of John Marshall Media. It's based on the book series Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. Our executive producers are Alana Favili and Joy Folks. This season was produced by John Marshall Cheery, Sarah Storm, and Robin Lott. This episode was written by Rebecca Behrens and edited by Joy Folks. Original theme music was composed and performed by Electra Barjaki, was also sound designed this episode. Mattia Marcelli is the sound mixer. Until next time, stay tuned and stay, stay rebel. rebel.